Good morning. Happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand. Mm -mm -mm. It is perfect, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Q&A for this morning. Very, very squat heavy. Ooh, not heavy squats, but squat heavy. Um, got two questions that came through in regard to some, some squatting uh, methods and they wanted to clarify a few things in regards to some muscle activity and some execution of technique that would emphasize different goals. So I thought I would put them in the Q&A together. So first one comes from Zhang. Zhang, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. So Zhang asks, um, what are the actions of the musculature above the level of the trochanter, such as upper glute max and performance at the bottom of a deep squat when the hips are flexed above 120 degrees? Do these muscles still contribute to the internal rotation of the femurs in a deep squat, or do they change the line of pull and become external rotators again? Okay, so this is a really good question. Let me grab the pelvis. Because it seems like, well, if they change from here to here, surely they change when we get when we get into the, the deeper element of the squat. The thing you have to understand about the, the deeper part of the squat is that we are reliant on the movement of the ilia relative to the sacrum in that deep squat. So we're looking at that type of a motion at the deepest portion of the squat, which means that I need to create a yielding strategy with this, this glute max in pure formus in this deeper portion, deeper portion of the squat. And so to we have to understand that at, at their distal attachment on the femur, because of the orientation of the pelvis relative to the femur, they're still going to be maintaining some internal rotation moment, right? So what you'll see, especially in Olympic weightlifters in the deepest part of say a, a, a snatch, is you'll actually be able to see this femoral internal rotation in the deepest part of the squat. The reason that they have to maintain some IR in the deepest portion of the squat is because they have to maintain an element of a concentric orientation in the pelvic diaphragm, otherwise they bottom out and then they can't reverse gears and come up out of the deep squat. But to get to the deep squat and to get the, the, the amount of, of uh, hip motion, I have to have this relative motion here. So yes, these mus the musculature above the trochanter is maintaining its internal rotation capabilities, but it will yield here posteriorly. So that's a really, really good question um, from, from Zhang, and I hope that that clarifies it. Now, Eddie from Germany, thanks for uh, staying in touch, bud. So Edward from Germany um, had a a clarification question on some of the heels elevated variations of the deep squat that we've been talking about. And so, so he asked, I, I was thinking about the lower portion of the squat, um, how we would have a more counter position, both ilia ER and a posterior outlet closure. How would the ball between the knees worker make sense? How about having a band around the knees and, and a ball between the knees simultaneously in squatting? Then we would start the inhalation of the top position and, and then exhaling to IR, squeezing the ball at about 90 degrees of reflection, then inhaling again um, against the, the band for, for the ER to sit down into the deep squat. Now, theoretically, that sounds great. However, when we're doing the heels elevated squat variations, our goal is to bias ourselves towards the inhalation. That's typically why we're doing it. It's not that you couldn't put the ball between the knees and try to reinforce the exhalation strategy through that mid-range, but the only goal with, with our, our deep squat with the band around the knees is to create a non-compensatory exhalation under those circumstances. So again, it's like, what is our intent with the exercise? So putting the ball between the knees and a band around the knees just increases the complexity of the activity and it may be totally unnecessary. Now, if your goal was to increase concentric orientation of the pelvic diaphragm through that middle range of the squat, there are definitely better solutions than using a heels elevated version, which is biased towards the inhalation. So what I would do then under those circumstances is we'd probably use some sort of box squat variation that would create the constraint of stopping the squat at a certain point so I don't get too much eccentric orientation of the pelvic diaphragm. I can use a much stronger exhalation strategy and create that upward movement off the box with the impulse of a concentrically oriented pelvic diaphragm. So, so I like the way you're thinking on that. I just don't think you need to add that kind of a complexity to the squat pattern. I, I think there's enough things that we, that we try to think about and we tend to create a lot of complexity in a lot of these exercises anyway. But like I said, I do appreciate your thinking. That's all I have for this morning. Um, I'm actually gonna be shooting probably some squat videos this week. 
Um, so stay tuned for those. Those will be up, um, probably up on the YouTubes at some point this week. And then if you have any questions, um, send them to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and we'll answer those as we go through the week. Have a great week. I'm going to go kill off this Neuro Coffee because it's delicious this morning. It's awesome, and I will see you guys later.